In the previous video, I covered a number of details about a career in patent law. If you watched that video, you already know you'll need to pass the patent bar exam to begin a career in the field of patent law and gain a designation as a patent agent or attorney. In this video, I'll go over the exam itself, including what it covers, how to study for it, and a few secrets to passing it on your first try. So, let's get started. First, a little about the exam. The patent bar exam consists of 100 multiple choice questions. Beginning in July of 2004, a company called Thompson Prometric took over the administration of the exam via computer. So now you may take the computer version of the exam weekdays throughout the year. Since Prometric is a national testing agency, there is likely a testing center located near you. And that makes taking the test very convenient. In addition to the computer-based exams by Prometric, the USPTO also offers paper and pencil exams once per year. This paper version is usually held in Alexandria, Virginia, so it's not nearly as convenient. The deadline to apply for the paper version is usually in May, while the actual exam date for the paper version is usually sometime in July. If you're interested in taking the paper version of the exam, you'll need to visit the USPTO's website and download the official application for the patent bar exam and read further instructions. Just as a side note, we see no benefit to taking the paper version of the exam. Both tests are structured so that both the computerized and paper versions share the same degree of difficulty. But unless you live near Alexandria and don't mind waiting until July, you may as well take the computerized exam. Regardless of whether you take the computerized or paper version of the exam, you may not bring anything with you the day of the exam. You will be granted access to the Manual of Patent Examining Procedure, MPEP. The MPEP is the only reference material you may access during the entire exam. In addition, the testing facility will also provide you with scratch paper and a pencil, both of which will be collected at the end of the exam. The patent bar exam consists of a morning and afternoon session with a one-hour break between the two sessions. Each session consists of 50 multiple choice questions. You will have three hours to complete each session. You will have to answer at least 70% of the questions correct in order to pass. One thing to mention is that although there are 100 questions, 10 of these questions may be beta questions, which means they're not graded. The point of this is to gauge the fairness of the questions before they're put into the actual question pool. Since you have 10 beta questions on your exam, you will still need to answer 70% of the questions correctly, which means you need to answer 63 correct in order to pass. You will have no way of knowing which questions are beta questions and which are not on your exam. So that's the exam in a nutshell. Now the interesting part that often causes problems for many test takers is before they begin any studying for the exam. They submit their application to take the exam to make sure they qualify. The problem is, once you've submitted your application and have been accepted to take the exam, you'll be given a 90-day window to take it. So the takeaway here is that you should start preparing for the exam well before you ever submit an application. If you meet the requirements to take the exam, then you should assume you may take it. Again, you can visit the USPTO's website and download the exam bulletin to read the official requirements. The link is under this video. It's crucial that you wait to apply for the exam until you've started your preparations, and we suggest that you're at least halfway through our course, which I'll cover in the next video. This is the best way to ensure you pass the exam before the 90-day window has expired. Otherwise, you can retake it, but you'll have to pay Prometric again and wait 30 days between exams. Their fee to administer the exam is $150. In addition to the Prometric fee, there is a non-refundable application fee and a registration examination fee. You'll want to check on the USPTO's website to see what the current fees are. As I mentioned before, the patent bar exam tests your knowledge of the Manual of Examining Procedure, MPEP. The MPEP is a few thousand pages long and it references many rules and laws established by the Patent and Trademark Office, PTO. There are two sources for the laws and rules covered in the MPEP. The first is a set of laws described in the United States Code Title 35, Patents. Most manuals refer to this group of laws as 35 U.S.C. The second source includes the rules described in the Code of Federal Regulations, Patents, Trademarks, and Copyrights. These are abbreviated as 37 CFR. 
As far as the patent bar exam is concerned, you only need to know the regulations covered in the patent section of 37 CFR. The MPEP includes all the relevant laws and rules you need to know to pass the patent bar exam. Within it, every angle of each law and rule is covered, in addition to forms useful to patent agents and attorneys and citations to important court cases. As the laws and rules and even the interpretations of the MPEP change, newer editions of the MPEP are published. You may expect a new edition to pop up every few years. But it's often the case that the patent bar exam lags behind the most current MPEP and is still covering older material. So it's very important that you check to see which version of the MPEP is currently being covered. It's not always the most recent MPEP, as you might expect. One of the most crucial things to take note of is that although the patent bar exam covers the MPEP, this manual is not an appropriate learning tool for preparing for the exam. Part of the problem is the MPEP is well over 3,000 pages in length, spread out over 27 major chapters. As you can imagine, it's not an easy read. It includes long, drawn-out laws and rules, citations to the long, drawn-out laws and rules, and endlessly lengthy paragraphs. It's full of legal jargon, and there's no glossary. So none of the terms are explained. It also doesn't really progress in order. So if you start in the beginning and go through the end, you'll likely be confused the entire way through. In addition, not everything in the MPEP is on the exam. There's no notes within it stating what will be on the test, so without help, you'll end up reading a lot that you don't need to know. Many patent bar candidates wind up drowning themselves in content and becoming completely lost. The result, they fail the exam, if they even attempt it at all, and they never pursue their dream of a career in patent law. The MPEP was written by the government for people practicing patent law, so that means it's a guide for lawyers currently practicing legal decision makers, and patent examiners. It's not meant to be a study tool. But the problem is, many people preparing for the exam use it as their main study tool. Many patent bar prep courses still ship out a 20-pound version of it for the people who buy their courses. It's laughable that anyone would want to study with this. And I can guarantee you, it's a big part of the reason why the overall pass rate for the patent bar exam hovers around 50%. Many of these very bright individuals with science and engineering backgrounds, some of which are currently or have already attended law school, struggle because they choose to turn to the MPEP instead of properly formatted prep materials. But you can increase this with the right prep and your due diligence. The first thing that you want to do is make sure to learn the most commonly tested material. One fact I should point out is when you do go to take the patent bar exam, you'll be given 100 questions. And it's important to note that these questions come from a larger question pool and are selected randomly for you. So that means even if you take the exam three times, which hopefully you won't have to, you'll get a different test-taking experience each time. But there are chapters from the MPEP that are definitely tested more frequently than others. You can virtually guarantee that they'll be on your test. Based on the careful statistics from paper and computerized exams over the last decade, the topics that you should know inside and out include claims from chapter 600, rejections from chapters 700 and 2100, application types, which you'll learn in chapter 200, patentability from chapter 2100, appeals covered in chapter 1200, reissues from chapter 1400, and lastly, re-examinations, which are covered in chapters 2200 and 2600. Even with the randomized format of the exam, we have found that these chapters are tested to the greatest extent. Therefore, these seven topics are the areas to spend some serious time on. And I've given you the chapters you need to review to learn them. Although between all of them, you're probably still looking at well over a thousand pages to read. Of course, many other topics will be tested on the exam. But if you really pay attention to these seven topics, you should know at least 50% of the material that will be covered on the test. That's pretty close to passing with just a handful of chapters. So no matter how you plan on preparing for the exam, make sure you've covered these seven core topics well before you go on to take it. That'll really increase your chances for passing. And to help out even further, we've also put together a few test-taking tips for you. These can be used when practicing for the exam as well as on exam day. Tip number one. There are 50 questions per exam section. Don't leave any answers blank. 
You may as well guess blindly on a question rather than leave it blank as there is no penalty for incorrect selections. The test is multiple choice, therefore you have a 1 in 5 chance of getting a particular question right by guessing. If you can narrow down the answer choices, your odds of guessing correctly will only improve. Out of 5 questions that you don't know the answer to, or do not have time to even read, you should statistically get one right just by blindly guessing. In some instances, that can make the difference between passing and failing the exam. Tip number two, skip the longer questions that require more reading. Save the longer questions for last, especially those pertaining to claim drafting, and answer the shorter questions first. The easiest and most straightforward questions are those that begin with something like, according to USPTO rules, which of the following are true? Most of the answers to these questions come straight from the MPEP. All of the questions are worth the same amount of points, so there isn't any reason to go after the longer, more difficult questions before attempting the easier, shorter ones. The computer-based exam has a way for you to flag a question as unanswered and go back to it. We suggest you use this feature on the longer questions. Tip number three, approach every answer choice as if it is a true or false question. This will help simplify the questions. Once you have identified whether a particular answer choice is true or false, write it down next to the corresponding letter, A, B, C, D, or E, on your scratch paper. Tip number four, be sure to distinguish whether you're looking for the most correct answer or the most incorrect answer. Write down on your scratch paper which of the two you're looking for. You may indicate this by simply writing true or false, correct or incorrect. Otherwise, you may get confused and answer a question incorrectly just by interpreting it wrong. Once you've determined what you're looking for, then go through the answer choices, like suggested in tip number three, and mark each one true or false. You will always be able to find the correct answer this way, even with the confusing wording of the questions. Tip number five, don't get too involved with the short story type questions. The best method for answering these questions is to read the very last sentence of the question and then look over the answers. In some cases, you will be able to determine whether a choice is true or false without even reading the preceding story. If you must read the story at all, skim through it quickly and take notes on the relevant information. All the story type questions will contain more information than you will ever need to determine the answer. The PTO just wants you to waste your time reading through unimportant information. Remember to keep this in mind. Tip number six. If a question seems as though there isn't a correct answer, or as though there is more than one correct answer, but no choice for both, don't automatically assume you're wrong. What you think is the correct missing answer may actually be right. Is this fair? Of course not. But unfortunately, there are times when the PTO will have questions that they do not provide a correct answer for. Any answer you choose will be correct in these cases, because credit will be given for that question as long as a selection is marked. Hopefully, these ambiguous questions will be seen less and less with a new computerized exam format, but they may still be there, so watch out for them. Tip number seven. The PTO always has at least a few old questions on any given exam. Sometimes up to 30% of the questions will be taken word for word from a previous exam. The computerized exams are no different. Familiarize yourself with old PTO questions, and you'll most certainly recognize some repeat questions you can breeze right through. It's not going to be enough to get you a passing level, but every question you answer correctly counts. I think you'll get a lot of mileage out of these seven tips, especially when combined with a list of core topics you need to study in and out. The last thing I want to tell you before I close this video presentation is this. One of the biggest tips for passing this exam is to use active learning methods to prepare for it. Active learning involves reading and taking notes, answering questions, and drilling the information as best you can. The material covered on the patent bar exam is too difficult to master by just passively watching videos or listening to CDs in your car. We've incorporated active learning methods into our course since we first began accepting enrollees starting in 2001. And that's one of the top reasons for the high success rate of our clients. In fact, we've incorporated active learning components into each of the three main steps of our course, which I'll cover for you in the next video. Make sure to watch the next video if you'd like to prepare for and pass the exam without reinventing the wheel. Any time you save by putting the patent bar exam behind you quickly can lead to starting your lucrative career in patent law much sooner. See you in the next video.